Development Coalition on Internet Values. Um, we do have one or two panelists that are actually going to join us a little bit late. Um, Dr. Cerf should be here in about 30 minutes or so, and I know we have some remote um, participants as well. Um, so just two or three minutes on this particular dynamic coalition and its history, and then we'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves and respond to a question which I'll actually pose in a moment. But this particular dynamic coalition came out of a workshop on the fundamentals, particularly around the core internet values, which was held back in 2009 in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And then following that workshop, a dynamic coalition was established, and there have been um, two other uh, presentations since that time, one at the IGF um, in Vilnius and another at the IGF in Nairobi. Um, this is the third meeting of the Dynamic Coalition, and one of the things we want to come out of this meeting with is really trying to be quite concrete about some next steps and some work. The purposes of the Dynamic Coalition are to actually do work between meetings, um, largely remotely. There's an awful lot of work being done on core internet values in various parts of the internet ecosystem, but I think we'd like to try and to define whether or not there's something specific we want to do here particularly in the multi-stakeholder format. So the, um, the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values um, was actually organized to debate questions such as what makes the internet what it is, what are its architectural principles, what are some of its core principles and values, and what's happening to them in the process of the internet's evolution. Um, so specifically when we talk about core values and principles, the things we often quote are openness, transparency, collaborative processes, bottom-up um, uh, local processes such as that's, that is embodied in the RIR process, um, and of course the distributed nature um, which uh, is central to how a lot of the work actually gets done across the internet ecosystem. Um, so over time, some of those principles and values have been um, threatened, I guess. Sometimes, you know, perhaps um, less intentionally in terms of trying to address or solve some problem um, without clear understanding of the impact it actually has on the Internet. Other times, um, we could probably ascribe more intent to some of those actions. So before I do that, I want to ask each one of the panelists to just take a moment and introduce themselves. And in particular, I'd like a quick reflection on whether or not they think the Internet principles are alive and well. Are they thriving, or are they under some level of, of um, threat, for lack of a better word? So I'll turn to my right. Um, and I'd actually like to, to um, thank Shiva as well, because Shiva was actually the driver and the instigator between the very first workshop um, has been central to the uh, other two and was very central and was sort of the driving force behind this particular workshop. So it's really to Shiva that we actually owe um, all of us being here today. One final comment. Um, while I am with the Internet Society and a number of the people on this panel here are Internet Society members, this is not an Internet Society workshop, panel, or dynamic coalition. The dynamic coalitions are defined by having members from th a minimum of three different multi-stakeholder communities. So if I say we, I am doing my best to say that we in the context of what we are here as a dynamic coalition, um, not specific to an ISOC set of activities um, or ISOC um, kind of ownership, if you will, for this particular idea. We all own the core internet values. So Shiva? Um, thank you, Lynn. Um, uh, uh, I'm uh, Siva Subramaniam. Uh, I, I serve as the president of uh, Internet Society India Chennai, which is also an ICANN at large structure. I'm from India, and uh, that's in brief about me. And uh, responding to the question by Lynn, I think uh, Internet core values are under a serious threat and a lot of uh, things that are happening all around us, a lot of changes, a lot of regulations that are proposed, uh, a lot of legislations underway, uh, they seek to threaten to alter the core values considerably. Um, and uh, 
In my opinion, a lot of these changes uh, are happening quite un unintentionally. It is not that uh, governments want to alter uh, core values intentionally. It is uh, just that uh, interne internet is new to us and internet uh, is new to governments. And uh, uh, there are several uh, departments uh, handling internet. For example, in uh, Germany, at least uh, six different ministries uh, uh, deal with uh, different policy functions related to internet and in France there are at least three ministries that uh, handle uh, different policy aspects of internet and uh, there are often not uh, sufficient coordination between these ministries and it so happens that sometimes uh, somebody in some department who does not uh, quite sufficiently understand uh, how internet works uh, tends to make uh, some policy changes, some policy proposals that uh, end up being very, very harmful to the internet and its core values. Uh, for example, uh, we know that uh, Government of India has been very, very positive and uh, the minister from India was here at this IGF, Minister Kapil Sibal, and um, uh, he has uh, understood the uh, internet and he has understood how internet governance works and um, he has been very positive and he was even saying that the term internet governance itself is, a mis no, is, a, is an oxymoron and uh, he was talking about internet accountability and to that extent he was positive, he was reaching out. At the same time, uh, somewhere else, from somewhere else in India, a proposal was filed at the ITU that was uh, very bad. Uh, I don't want to use a different language, I would simply say that the proposal was very, very bad. And, uh, that uh, So this is one example of how uh, lack of coordination between government departments uh, give rise to some proposal that invariably end up uh, threatening the core internet values. So what uh, the core uh, values coalition and what uh, the internet institutions uh, could do is to um, make sure that um, every corner of uh, uh, the policy making sphere understands uh, how the internet works and uh, once uh, there is sufficient understanding of how internet works and uh, how it has to evolve I think uh, most of the policies will be in uh, in the proper direction thank you thank you Shiva that was very very clear I'm just going to go direct through the the panelists because I really do want an exchange amongst the panelists and to invite the remote participation and obviously the the individuals here in the room as well so the purpose of this run through is to just get sort of a broad, broad perspective of, of views. Sebastian Bachelet. Thank you, Lynn. And, and thank you, Shiva, for uh, organizing and supporting this uh, dynamic coalition since uh, the inception. I am uh, a member of uh, ISOC and I am board member of ICANN. Uh, but I am not talking on behalf of any of those uh, organizations. Uh, I want to, to follow what Shiva uh, just explained and, and push a little bit uh, further. Uh, we, we, it seems that in a lot of countries, uh, whatever the type of uh, political organization, uh, democratic or not totally democratic or not democratic at all, um, we end up with the same type of um, decision to make a law each time we have a trouble with uh, something who happened once on internet and um, we end up to add law to law to law and um, in fact um, uh, the situation uh, will be better handled by uh, the private sector, the um, um, civil society and um, uh, in, in discussion, in finding some consensus discussion and um, uh, the, the fact that uh, it's very often ending in the parliament where people are not uh, really aware of what is happening, uh, they take bad decision and then it's one element who stress certain more uh, the internet as we knew it and as we would like to have it in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Paul Wilson. 
Uh, hi, I'm from um, the uh, organisation APNIC, the um, Regional Internet Address Registry for the Asia Pacific. So we're a, a member of the technical uh, community and have been uh, for coming up to, to 20 years. Uh, we operate as a, a non-profit neutral community organisation that has got this particular technical um, responsibility of managing IP addresses. And I guess be because we are a, a predominantly technical organisation, we've taken a fairly pragmatic and practical view of what we do. We know, we know well what we have to do and we know technically how to do it and, um, and probably haven't t spoken so much about the values, the vision or the values behind what we do. Um, but I think uh, as years have gone by, and particularly as we get into this mu much more complex uh, world that I think the, the IGF uh, ex exemplifies, it's, um, it's become more and more important for us to talk about our values, to have people understand uh, what we as an organisation are. And I think it's, it can be said fairly, um, fairly reliably that movements and organisations that actually have values and vision to express are, uh, are generally more uh, successful than those that go from day to day on a... Um, uh, just knowing simply what they do and uh, and how they do it. So we've been spending a bit of, t of time on this, and I think I think the same thing uh, that I've described there actually goes for the internet itself. That um, that the idea of having uh, identified some identified vision and and a set of values for the internet gives us a very good um, very good idea if down the track the internet were to change um, I mean and that's what we're talking about here we're talking about the way the internet might might evolve in future I mean I think whatever network we're uh, we're using in future it's going to be an IP based network and we'll call it the internet but how would we know if the internet 10 or 15 years down the track has become a different internet from the one that we we enjoy today uh, it may not be so easy to tell but it certainly helps if we have an idea of the values that are being supported and the vision of the of the internet and how it um, how it is really intended by a consensus of us to to uh, to operate. I think um, to the question that Lynn asked um, is whether the principles of the internet, um, which I think we do need to enumerate, whether those principles are, are here with us today. And I actually think they are. I think the only reason why the internet has has been absolutely the only reason why the internet has been so successful is because of values that are either implicit or ex explicit uh, in, in the way it's been envisaged and the way it's run. And, uh, and the internet today is still thriving. Internet, internet growth is phenomenal. The, the growth of, uh, of applications, of content, of, of usage and of the user base of the internet is, is phenomenal. So today, today we're, doing, we're doing well. The question is whether tomorrow um, the internet, or as I said, 10 or 15 year, years down the track, the internet might have... Might be on a path towards change that um, that does d uh, damage those values and, and the success. Um, so the values are, th are things like the internet as a as a single global accessible network that links uh, every point of, of the internet to every other point. Um, the the fact that it's a neutral network where the the actual infrastructure of the internet the internet itself actually is separate from and can be separated from the applications and the content that. Um, that run across it, whether the internet continues to be uh, open uh, and accessible. These, these actually are, um, uh, th these are values that I think we all actually understand these days and they're, they're, they're critical values. They're values which have been actually de delivered to us and they've been ena enabled by the, both the original design of the internet and the, the way that it has been maintained. I mean, we tend to take these things for granted. As, as I said, the internet is the internet and we just sort of think we know what it is. But in fact, those things have not been delivered automatically or sort of magically by the internet. They've been designed and they've been and they've been maintained. So there are uh, numerous ways uh, in which those um, those values may or may not be served by by developments um, in over time. We might um, see a sort of fragmentation of the internet down the track, and an increase in the complexity of the internet down the track, where you have. Uh, um, fragments of the internet which have uh, more complex interconnections uh, between them than, than exist today. That could happen, f that could be a result, for instance, of, of a failure over the next 10 years for I of IPv6 to be deployed. So at a technical level you get a, you get a fragmentation and a, and a breakdown of the global nature of the internet. It could also happen by political um, uh, policies, by, by policies, regulations being adopted that actually start to break the, the internet up. 
the neutrality of the internet likewise is something that could be um, threatened by various different factors, whether it's, it's sort of commercial decision making that becomes predominant or whether it's and, and unregulated, whether it's, um, whether it's other um, governmental or, re or regulatory actions. I mean, the, the interesting thing about network neutrality is that the term didn't exist before the internet at all. It, um, the term prior to the internet, there was no such thing as a neutral network because a, a, a network was provided by a telecoms carrier that, uh, that bundled the transportation and the applications and everything you did in, into, a, into a stack of services. And it was, it was never neutral, or it, it couldn't be neutral. Um, so network neutrality, the ability to have a debate about net network neutrality, no matter what your position on it, is the, the uh, privilege we have of having a debate about it is something that the internet has delivered to us. And uh, once again, that's something that could be eroded and disappear so that we find ourselves uh, technically unable or for other reasons unable to, to deliver a network that's, uh, that's neutral in the same way as the internet is today. And that sort of debate um, then, then becomes a thing of the past. So... You know, there's, there's many aspects of this, and, and I won't, I won't uh, go on hogging the microphone, but um, I think um, the, the Internet is thriving, the values are still with us. I think um, there, are, there are all sorts of circumstances, call them threats or inadvertent, uh, inadvertent um, circumstances that might change or threaten the values that we have, and I, I think it's really useful in this forum to be ac able to actually talk about those things and sort of identify them and, and help, to, help to understand how we'd recognise if they disappeared or, or how we might help uh, to avoid that from happening. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. And that was actually a, a nice, nice level, a nice thorough sort of expose of some of the internet values. I actually can't see what the name tag says right to your immediate left. And if it says, okay, Desiree. Um, Desiree was actually a, a tentative. And apologies for some of the flux in the panel here. There were a number of other workshops that are scheduled in parallel and people are fighting over resources. Correct, Olivier? <laughs> um, so let's move to Alejandro. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, my name is Alejandro Pisanti. I am uh, the chair of ISOC Mexico and a professor at the National University of Mexico. Um, I, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the university and um, very tentatively speaking in, in, in behalf of the chapter, because this, this is work that will go back there. Uh, first, I, I want to join Lynn in, in praising enormously the, the efforts of uh, Shiva, Subramanian, Motusami. Uh, he has kept the continuity of the, of the effort in times that were of the rest for many other of us, and uh, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm enormously thankful and in recognition uh, of, 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 of what you're, you have enabled us to achieve and achieved yourself. Uh, we, we, we really have a great depth of gratitude to you. Uh, the, I, it, it, it's hard to, to improve on, on what Paul Wilson has already said. I think that uh, it, it, there's, there's something to add, which is that these threats are very concrete. The, the threats that I see are very concrete. They are pervasive. They are of a permanent nature, and they are of a recurring nature. We, it's not only that some actors or some involuntary circumstances will continue to present. It's also that new actors or new circumstances will continue to present. We can only not foresee when and how strongly uh, a company will do something, including lobbying a government for legislation uh, to inter that actually interferes with, uh, with network neutrality. That's the one of the, 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 the most visible threats right now uh, that will interfere with the end-to-end -end principle or other of the technical principles. Uh, we don't know whether an apps developer will come up with something that becomes very popular and will actually be uh, breaking the openness and the interoperability uh, to which we have become used. But we have, I think we have also become used uh, to see the threats coming and we should be warned about them. Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's my assessment about this, this general, let's say at the more technical level of the, of the core principles, and certainly the principles of collaboration, decentralization, uh, the, the whole multi-stakeholder setup uh, are also continuously both being built up and uh, being threatened. When I see this kind of circumstance, my reflex now is to think of, uh, of performing a risk assessment 
which has to be very objective. It includes strengths and weaknesses. It includes uh, threats that are very improbable, very unlikely, but would be of very high impact. It includes classifying the threats by, by their uh, impact and probability, therefore. And uh, to try to make a rational assessment, uh, I think there is uh, in an important space to do this in the format of a dynamic coalition uh, or, or a similar one in the sense that many organizations that come together in different fora are able to perform some parts of this and we are able to crowdsource and bring in a more popular and uh, uh, open participation to this by individuals, small companies, small consultancies, uh, government units, uh, the whole multi-stakeholder gamut, and that would be a, uh, one possible task to perform that would grow on the competences and strengths of the existing organizations and do that a lot more to the mix. Thank you, Alejandro. Excellent as ever, and thank you for repeating the thanks to Ziva as well. Um, Nick, um, I want to make sure you really feel like you're a part of the panel and not sort of falling off the table there, so if we need to move down a little bit, we'll We'll scoot down, um, but please introduce yourself and give us your thoughts on the Internet values. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn, and um, my thanks also to uh, Shiva for keeping the flame alight uh, when, when there weren't many others to carry it, um, and, and I'm glad to be here today. Um, I'm Nick Ashton Hart. Uh, I'm the Geneva representative of the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Um, which has the privilege and burden of being the only technology industry association that has a permanent presence in Geneva. So I get to watch the sometimes painful way in which struggles over the identity of the Internet play out in different aspects of, of international policy, be they at the ITU uh, or in the World Trade Organization where there are negotiations on liberalizing services and a recognition that the openness of the Internet is of key economic importance to the future, interestingly enough. Um, and, and there is a, I think there are, there, is, there are values to the Internet, there's no question. Um, the application of those values, I think, is the difficult part. Um, if you think of the Internet as a general purpose technology, affects everything, uh, not just some things. Um, the last, I think, m the, probably the best example was the development of the steam engine in the 1800s. And if you think about that, before the steam engine came about, time was not synchronized. Every village in England had different time. The reason they had to create a common time was because of railway schedules, railways which were made possible by the steam engine. People literally traveled by horses, and it took so long to travel between points, you didn't need to have common time. And so you think about the total transformation in life of just changing from having village time to national time. And I think this is what the Internet is doing to the modern world. It's completely transforming everything about it. And not everyone wants to be transformed. Not everyone wants to see the same videos. Not everyone wants their nationals to see the same information. Um, human rights are recognized in pretty much every country, but we would not recognize the application of those rights in many countries as being congruent with our concept of what those rights mean. And uh, so I think that the challenge is going to be to recognize that we need to have common understandings of the architecture of the Internet and of its, its core characteristics, which must be respected in order for it to be used for any purpose, while living with the fact that at times the application of norms, social norms, to what people use the Internet for will vary widely and that there are societies which are not willing to accept a globalized concept of the individual at the same pace as others. Wh whether we like that or not, I think we're going to have to, to recognize that people, different cultures have a right to define their norms slightly differently, even if we disagree with them, because otherwise we will see the internet becoming balkanized. We will see private 
country networks like we are seeing in Iran and the like. Um, and then we are all lessened by the result. And I, I suspect that's a controversial uh, conception. But I'm, I'm, I see, at the moment, I see the way in which content is perceived and the way in which the network is perceived being conflated together. And the result is it's easier for countries to say, well, let's just turn off the connection. Let's just create a firewall and attempt to remove what we don't like. It's not very successful doing that, as we've seen, because people in China find a way around, you know, freedom finds a way, speech finds a way. But I think this is going to be a key challenge, is, is those countries which socially even have a consensus that say this is not something we are willing socially to see or read or hear, how are they to be able to feel comfortable with the globalized parts of the Internet that do work for them and for everyone else? This is going to, I think, be a key, a key policy challenge and, and an, an uncomfortable one for all of us who would like to see the, democrat, the, the democratizing and leveling characteristics of the Internet carried to every corner. It may take a little longer for that vision to become, to become reality than we would like. Thank you, Nick. Um, I want to kind of moderate this in quite a light way. So I'm going to first ask the panelists if anybody wants to react to Nick's comments. I think he was trying to elicit a response or a reaction there. Um, second, to ask if there's any other uh, discussion the panelists would like amongst themselves. And I'm looking to see if there's any remote um, participation or questions from, from the audience. And I do see there's one back there. Um, while we actually get um, a mic, could I see if there's anybody who wants to take up Nick's challenge with what he thought was a somewhat controversial statement? I'd Sebastian. rather see the audience. Sebastian actually wants to. Thank you. Yeah, following what Nick's just uh, expressed, I uh, fully agree with him, but I am not sure that it's uh, just a case of uh, the democratic or not democratic country. It's also happened in the democratic country where there are. Um, um, decisions that uh, part of uh, publication can't be uh, on internet and uh, uh, that um, the open internet it's not anymore open and uh, when you have uh, difficulty to uh, to access uh, to different uh, publication it's a start of uh, censorship and uh, then I, I of course, we feel uh, that it's more important what is happening in uh, uh, some non-democratic regime, but I, I would like to say that it's uh, more broader than just uh, those countries. Thank you. Thank you. So there was a question from the audience, which we'll go to, and that'll give me a moment to get Vince settled. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Great. and could you introduce yourself as well? My name is Courtney Raj. I am with Freedom House and I'm also an academic writing my dissertation about cyber activism. And so I'm very interested by um, the last person's comments. I'm sorry I didn't catch your name, Vince. Nick, okay. Um, I, you know, you mentioned at the end about the efforts by Iran to create its own national internet. We see this very much uh, across the world as regimes are lear learning from each other, et cetera. Um, but I was fascinated by your uh, example of time and how that developed out of the STEAM network. And time does not belong to any countries, right? The countries do not sovereignty over time. So why? do we not conceive of the internet as something, why are we, why, or let me rephrase that, why are we conceiving of the internet based on sovereign not nation state boundaries? Um, the, the, doesn't the internet hold the potential along with other trends such as the power of multinational corporations um, and the power of individuals to connect across borders 
hold the potential for conceiving of a different organized set of organizing principles outside of nation state sovereignty. And I think that it would be interesting to hear at this forum if we can get beyond this idea of the nation state. And it concerns me both from a human rights perspective, but also as an individual who's grown up, you know, with the internet, that we're still conceiving of the internet and its rules as being governed by states and that they should still get to, that they govern their citizens. So we don't care what they do inside of their borders, but online we have the potential to have something different. So I would love for us to think about how, how do we make that possible? So thank you. That's also a very, um, I'm lacking a word this late in the day question. So let me first go to Nick because the question was specifically directed to him. And then we'll ask Vint to come in and add any comments he'd like to to the, to the last comment. We actually started this discussion with um, some discussion on the core internet values and a question of are they alive and well, are they under threat? Um, well, I would say, you know, can we, can we move to a conception that is not based on the old centuries old concept of sovereignty? I certainly hope that's true. I certainly uh, hope that's true. In fact, I think it's inevitable that we will do. I think you already see social constructions which on the internet which are not boundary related. They're bounded by what people identifying with other people that are perceived to be like them, which is a more human construct than a, than a physical border. Um, but just like it, it wasn't overnight that people said, well, I'm going to give up my concept of time in my village and agree on a national or an international concept of time. It actually took a little while. There's some interesting books on it. It was quite controversial, and people felt very strongly about this. They felt that if they gave up the ability to determine what time it was, they were giving up their concept of the world in a real visceral way. This is why you still have daylight savings time in this kind of stuff. We, in two and a half centuries, we haven't totally disposed of this. We're still changing the time in the summer because of the the perception of people who wake up early in agrarian environments. So I hope and I believe that that vision, that we will get to that vision. All I'm saying is I think we may have to be patient. It may take some time for social constructions to catch up with a boundaryless world. That's all. So Vin, if you could also just say a word or two to introduce yourself. I'm sure you're known to everybody here, but when people look back at these archives in 10, 20, 30 years... They'll wonder, who was that bearded, ancient uh, person? Uh, hello, I'm the talking dinosaur on the, uh, on the panel. My name is Vince Cerf. Uh, I'm uh, vice president and chief internet evangelist at Google. The question that you've raised is one which uh, I have recently become intensely interested in, thanks to two things that have happened in literally the last few days, partly a consequence of this Internet Governance Forum. Bertrand de la Chapelle, who is probably known to you, is uh, the 21st century reincarnation of an 18th century French philosopher. And he gives us much to think. He says that the notion of sovereignty in a highly connected environment may have to change because actions taken on sovereign grounds may have impact on others outside of the territory of that sovereign domain. He gives an analogy where a river is flowing through country A and country A chooses to pollute the river just as it leaves the borders of country A and flows into country B, visiting all kinds of serious uh, and deleterious results on country B. The gentleman, the minister from uh, India, Mr. Sipal, made a rather bold statement that sovereignty was dead and that the concept of sovereignty was, uh, was no longer appropriate in the Internet environment. I'm not quite prepared to give up all notions of sovereignty, but I will tell you and remind you that John Perry Barlow wrote an interesting manifesto about the online environment of cyberspace. Uh, I, can't, I can't reproduce it literally, but uh, it basically said uh, the cyberspace is a different universe and the U, U governments can butt out. 
I don't think we can quite get away with this yet, and here's why. If we want to adopt a non-national kind of environment in the Internet, we have to emulate at least some of the protections that are given to us under the notion of sovereign uh, social contract. We expect governments to protect the citizenry. We actually give up some of our freedoms in exchange for a safer environment. When we're harmed, we expect that the state will have set up processes so that we can recover from that harm, that the, that the victim has recourse against the uh, party perpetrating the harm. Uh, there are a variety of other social order elements that show up in this social contract. If we are going to move away from the mechanisms that sovereignty gave us, we will have to find a way to reincarnate something like that in the cyberspace environment, because if we don't, then we will have no recourse against harms occurring to us in that space. So this isn't to argue that sovereignty needs to be retained necessarily, but it's an argument that something has to be introduced into the cyberspace environment that provides protections uh, and assurances of safety uh, for people who are using that space, and that may take some effort. Yes. And just while the mic is is going to the young woman there, are there any questions from the remote participants in queue? Not yet. So I think that might be the case if we're talking about democracies, but I think if you look at North Korea, if you look at Burma before the transition, if you look at many authoritarian governments, there is no social contract, right? Um, so we're talking about sovereignty, I think, in, in the United States is very different, but the, pr the, the problem with this idea of national sovereignty is that means that they get to control whatever they want to do over that population of the citizenry. And so, you know, when we're talking about the Internet, I think that looking at the na nation state as being sovereign over these parts. I mean, this is what's happening in Iran. That's why they're able to create their own internet. Same with, you know, Saudi Arabia being able to create only one internet access point and control all internet flows. And I disagree that we're that we're definitely on the track towards getting a, above and beyond that notion. I think that there's a very strong pushback against that, and that there are many states and democracies included um, who are very much trying to maintain the traditional concepts of sovereignty. So I would just push back a little bit on that. Let's, let's keep pushing. Um, and I, I still want to debate with you. First of all, um, you seem to have avoided the point that I was trying to emphasize, which is that if, we're going, if it were in fact possible to create a kind of uniform cyberspace, which we do not have for the, exactly the reasons that you just outlined, but supposing we had one, we are still going to expect a kind of social contract in that environment. May I ask if you reject that? You want to be unsafe in the Internet? Is I that what you're we, looking for? I think we would need multiple social contracts. I don't think there's going to be a single social contract. Then you're going to have a really tough time figuring out how to deal with jurisdiction. You have a big problem. Now you have to come back to the table with a design that does what you want it to do because right now I don't see it. Uh, so I, I'm not disagreeing that with the vision that you have necessarily, but I would uh, posit that we are certainly going to need some kind of protections. You're saying maybe more than one. I don't understand how the jurisdictional question gets solved, but let's set that aside for a moment. The other side of the coin is reality, and that is that the Internet is constructed out of real things. It may be an ethereal space of concepts and uh, uh, sort of abstractions, but it arises out of a real physical system. And the real physical system does lie inside of nation-state boundaries. And unless we were going to do away with nation-states, which I think is not likely to happen in the near term, they will have the ability to do a certain amount of control. So the uh, attractive vision that you dangle in front of us uh, is not necessarily reachable if there are if nation states, as they exist today, have the ability to control that virtual environment that, uh, that you seek to, uh, to instantiate, 
I don't know how to undo that either. No matter how hard we may work at special pieces of uh, software to tunnel our way out of the, the traps that, uh, that we uh, might uh, exist in, uh, there is still, that's still an artifact. And anything we can do technically, other people can interfere with. So I think we're a ways away from being able to realize that vision. But it's very important to recognize that if we were to realize the vision, we still have to figure out how to make it a place that we want to live in. Thank you, Vin. And Alejandro's asked to get in the queue. Uh, thank you, uh, Lynn. I, again, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the radio format here. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is Alejandro Pisanti speaking. Uh, I think this exchange points us in towards some of the things that would, ways to do things and things to attend to that will be very productive for a group of interested people of all stakeholder groups. Uh, so I'll go back first. Uh, this uh, post-Westphalian uh, regime, which would look beyond, let's say, to, to, to have a lot more power and a lot more of life defined by life on the net instead of life determined by nation states, uh, has been pointed out uh, long ago, among others, by Wolfgang Kleinwächter in the Internet Governance Sphere. And along before that, with uh, utopian cyberspace visions of uh, John Perry Barlow and many others. Uh, it has also been described by Manuel Castells as the space of flows. And it's something that we actually do know a lot about. And of course, we know a lot about that. And we know a lot about the limits that we find, uh, the boundaries that we meet, and the walls against we, w we bump when we get to the nation states. And we know that some of the walls among, between nation states are a lot harder uh, and less porous, like the, some of the ones you mentioned. In a UN context like the Internet Governance Forum, we refrain from pointing out to specific countries, but uh, the innuendo and other uh, rhetoric tricks allow you to know exactly who you are speaking about even more. Um, so the, the way I see that this very valuable exchange uh, feeds into the work of the dynamic coalition. It's a very concrete, it's a very direct funneling. Uh, what we want to see happening over the next years is that the way the internet continues to be built and expanded, and it's not the way the, the internet grows and expands because that doesn't happen spontaneously. It's people, companies, governments, technical organizations doing it. So the way the internet continues to be built and expanded has to be in such a way that uh, it allows by design or even incentivates and uh, invites by design to live more in the space of flows, to live more, uh, to make more easy to have the trans those transnational flows that are easy to do, that are the low-hanging fruit, like the transfer of information, for example, communication, right to free speech, right to free association. These are easily available compared to things like taxation or, as Vint mentioned, the, the, the ultimate social function of the monopoly of legitimate monopoly of force uh, that corresponds to protecting the citizens militarily or, or let's say, at, at the level of physical security. That's a harder wall to climb. What we do want is to make sure that the design with neutrality, with openness, with interoperability, with multi-stakeholder decentralized decision making goes in the way of uh, enabling this transnational global way of working uh, against a trend which would enable more easily the national boundaries to prevail more strongly against even those things that we have already achieved to do in the space of flows. And that will tell us uh, a lot of what we have to be watchful for. If we see, as you mentioned, national internets, if we see n layers of national internets like proposals to administrate the IPv6 addressing uh, with a national administration, if we see uh, coercion or legal mandates to link uh, IDNs to nationalized CCTLD management instead of the enlightened global CCTLD management we have, uh, and that to things like taxation, civil life expression, re individuals registration before speaking, anything that builds that platform 
that would we, we would have to cause an alarm to be sounded and action to be taken by those who can actually take action. So I think that fits very directly into the need for this dynamic coalition to exist and operate. This is, I'm sorry, I don't mean to prolong this necessarily, but uh, it occurs to me that um, as if you look at this sort of utopian uh, view of, uh, of internet, one thing you need to keep in mind is you are not your avatar. You are you, your avatar is only a representation of you, the map is not the territory. Uh, and it's inescapable that the Internet is rooted in a physical world. Uh, so if we're going to um, move away from purely national boundaries for legal jurisdictions and the like, there will have to be at least some amount of multilateral or global agreement about uh, s social norms and at least legal norms that will allow... Uh, abuses to be dealt with in this cyber environment. Well, I have to thank you for the question. It's obviously given rise to a lot of very interesting debate. Um, and I also appreciate Alejandro, I think, starting to move the discussion forward to what might this dynamic coalition do going forward. But before we pick that up, there actually was a, a question or a comment from a ro remote participant. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, as a follow-up uh, to previous questions, um, um, we got uh, several uh, questions from our remote uh, uh, participants. Uh, uh, first question uh, was from Julie McPhee. As entertainment is increasingly delivered via internet content distribution networks, how many of these affect peering arrangements and the end-to-end -end principle as users access content rather than hosts? The next question was um, from uh, United States, uh, from Marcus Ledergerber. Do we all agree that there is just one internet? And the last one, uh, was to Mr. Windsurf, balance between sovereignty, openness, regulation, and national laws seems to me a very tricky and hard job to do. So my question to Windsurf, which body do you think would have the task to manage this complex task? Okay, shall I try to answer the, the last one? Uh, maybe, this dynamic coalition is where that solution starts. Maybe this is a group that can begin examining what's possible and what isn't. It's pretty clear, though, that if you're going to have international agreements that create a kind of homologized uh, legal framework, that ultimately you're going to have to go to bodies like the World Trade Organization or the World Intellectual Property Organization, or other parts of, uh, of the UN, or you're going to have to go to a collection of multilateral treaties uh, in order to establish agreement. I think we'll probably end up starting with the lowest common denominator, simple things. For example, what does a notarization mean, and does it, or what's a digital signature mean, and does it have common weight in all countries? We're going to have to build this up a little bit at a time. I don't think there's one body that solves all the problems. I think there were two other, what about, what about two other, questions, two other that questions that were posed. Um, one was, do we all agree there's one internet? And the other question had to do with content and peer-to-peer -peer and um, whether the impact on the end-to-end. -end. So I'm sure Vince ready to jump in and respond to that, but is there anybody else who wants to? You would be a brave Nick, person. Nick, Nick and then Paul. Uh, yeah, this is Nick Ashton Hart. So on the content question, I'll take that one since I will be cursed for the rest of my life in dealing with, with copyrighted material and what happens to it, given that I was a music manager for over 20 years off and on. Um, 
This is the great, this is a, a perfect example of the clash between sovereignty, law, and the, the, the real world of the internet and how it's really used. Um, the copyright system is, is a national system and it's implemented different in different countries. And yet cloud computing by its nature means that you access the same resource two different times in the same day and you are accessing multiple different servers in multiple different countries on each of those occasions. It, <laughs> and, and the application, the, the, how to deal with the, the legal issues there, there has been a treaty negotiation going on in Europe for 50 years to try and determine how international law and, and private law, the law of individual countries, works together. And they have been unable to agree this. <laughs> this is an enormously thorny question. Um, and it, I think it's, uh, it's certainly true that the, the, the desire for enforcement has an impact on what people can access. We all can see that the iTunes store has different material at different times. And, and I do think we're going to have to come up with some way to internationalize the way in which, which rights, national rights work in an international environment. There's, there's going to have to be some way around that, not just for entertainment content, but, but simply for the, the, the efficient functioning of services upon which increasingly large amounts of, of the economy rely. Um, Pfizer, one of the world's largest drug companies, recently transferred its entire supply chain and connected directly all of its vendors to a cloud-based system so that they can see in real time absolutely everything about their product, where they're being made, where they're being shipped, where they're running out of them. And this is, this is going to become increasingly the case. And the more of the world that is integrated in that way, the more in which conflicts of laws become very difficult. There's going to have to be some, some change in the conception of how, how laws work uh, on the Internet. And, and I think the 50-year conversation will end much soon. It won't take another 50 years because the commercial realities of dealing with this will require an, uh, a pragmatic result that wasn't required by the situation over the last 50 years. It was an academic discussion for 50 years because it could be. Now, now it's not academic anymore. Thank you, Nick. Paul? I wanted to answer the question about one internet in a, in a, in a slightly different way, and that's, um, but it's a way that depends on, um, on how you define, in, define the internet um, in, as, in asking the question, because I used the term loosely um, before in terms of how what would the internet be like um, ten years down the track or some sometime down the track, and would it become a different internet in that case, the internet is kind of everything it 's the universe that we 're talking about there 's only only just one of those. but if you start to, to drill down through that either to the level of users or content or applications, then it 's really in the internet 's in the eye of the beholder, and there are many different ways to perceive the internet. And I think it's within all of those layers that we start to get a bit confused in internet governance. What are we really talking about? There's the broad definition, there's the narrow definition. But actually speaking te technically, the internet is the transport layer of the, the network that we're talking about. It is the thing that, that I was referring to before that is the, the single global neutral network that uh, allows any point to connect to any other point. And actually that thing is in its... Uh, in its ideal form that, that we are all working to preserve, it is one network, and and that is the beauty of it. So let's not let's not sort of mix ourselves up too much about saying which internet we're talking about. And yes, there are many, or or yes, there are none. Because if you want to be quite specific about the internet layer of the network that we all enjoy, the internet layer is the transport layer. There has to be just one of those, and it's really not a matter of perspective. It really is is simply the technical infrastructure, and that is something that. As within this discussion about values, we should really identify, um, as I say, which which internet we're talking about. And be quite quite precise about that. Thanks. So uh, it's Vint again, and uh, I'd like, like to make a small nuance here. We all understand that the internet protocols don't necessarily have to be used in the global interconnected system. People have used these same protocols to build private networks. But I don't consider those to be capital I internet. Those are lowercase i. 
uh, clones that are, have, don't have the same scope and probably have very different intent. Uh, I wanted to come back, though, to uh, this question of, of rights management and uh, dealing with uh, intellectual property in a digital environment. It occurs to me that if we treat content as digital objects for just a moment, not differentiating what they are, whether they're books, novels, music, or some uh, a game or some other thing, piece of software, just imagine them as bags full of bits. And if we thought that it was possible to build mechanisms for access control to those bags of bits so that there was some form of enforcement for access and use, if we thought it was possible to achieve that, then we might actually come to a general purpose solution to the problem of, that you were talking about, Nick. And so I think there may be technical mechanisms that uh, might be implemented to make access to digital content and digital objects of all kinds manageable. And here, I think, uh, if we were able to demonstrate uh, that you could establish whatever terms and conditions you wished and that these uh, for access and use, and if those terms and conditions could really be enforced, technically enforced, uh, then many of the problems that... Uh, have arisen in the national context of copyright, for instance, would evaporate and be assimilated into this more general system. So I want to see if there are any remote participants or anybody here in the audience who would like to either follow up or engage on any of the discussions to date or um, a new topic. We need a mic up here in the front row. Hi, my, my name is Subhi Chaturvedi, and I teach journalism and communication at Delhi University, and I run a foundation called Media for Change. Um, we just put together one of the first IGFs in India, and uh, um, I, I, I think it's been a fantastic experience for me just to have been here and experienced this. But when we're looking at the core values of the Internet, and there have been several threads that I've absorbed just now, um, and the fact that we're having a discussion, but I'm, I'm coming from a country which is India, and uh, when we talk about access, um, diversity precedes access, and I do not think that the question of internet as a physical layer that transports data, because the internet in India per se, has been an enabler. It's been a facilitator. It's meant different things to different people. And as uh, uh, probably Susan would read things, um, it is not one thing but many. And when we're looking at core values, I wanted Wint in particular to address this because I, I would slightly disagree. The discussion on the Internet and, and the future of the Internet has almost not been academic enough. On the contrary, it's been in every space possible. I would, on the other hand, suggest that we need to institutionalize learnings, both from the IGF. It's been a fantastic bottoms of approach. So there are two questions there, um, because there's clearly, um, and I'm, I'm putting this across in the context of the ITU and the ITRs. We're looking at a situation where we could be writing binding, mandatory treaties. So what happens to core values? Values such as permissionless innovation, openness, the idea of putting together structures and the modularity of internet, because clearly some of the issues that the I new ITRs are trying to address are local, they're domestic, and then we're trying to bring in questions like IP to IP interconnectivity in spaces such as those. So uh, my concerns are many, and there are several threads and strains of questions. I don't even know if I've been able to articulate the right thing, but if some of the panelists could comment or take those issues up, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. I'm sure Vince in the queue. Um, yeah. Anybody, anybody else? Anybody else? Alejandro and Nick. Uh, thank you, and I will ask you for your name later for the record and keeping. And uh, 
I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that the discussion is not academic enough. In the same, at the same time that I hear, especially at the same time that I hear that the discussion is too academic. I think we are lacking, uh, we're continuously lacking uh, discussions in both senses. We, uh, I think there's a dearth of academic, solid academic research and reflection uh, that has to expand the, the body that's already growing in, from many other angles. And on the other hand, we have to be able to take the knowledge, uh, the, uh, the informed opinion that we are obtaining in the, in, in, from academic discussions down to, to the questions that you have mentioned, for example, how to institutionalize the knowledge c coming from the IGF without institutionalizing the, I the IGF too much, because that's one thing that we, 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 we continuously uh, want to, 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 I won't say to avoid, but to manage properly. Uh, and again, you mentioned what happens to the core values. Things like the ITRs have the potential to crystallize or uh, to, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, say, I'll keep it there, to, crisp, to crystallize things that should continue to be flexible. And uh, that's a kind of permanent watch that probably a well-functioning dynamic coalition should be in uh, on core internet values, should be able to at least report on and maybe uh, deliver the appropriate calls for action. So we'll go to Nick and then Vint, and then in the last 15 minutes, that was an excellent series of questions. In the next 15 minutes, I'd like to go to um, what might this dynamic coalition address going forward? Um, the reason we keep coming back with these workshops is because we have interesting discussions like this and we find enough of interest to get us hooked. Um, we get just now to take the next step and be a little more concrete so we can actually keep it alive between forums. So Nick? I will try and, and start on that with this. Uh, your, your questions are excellent ones, and, and it made me think that perhaps one of the answers is um, Wicket itself, because as Alejandro and others have described, because Wicket is designed to regulate the relationships that can impact the permissionless nature of interconnection, as you put it, the fundamental foundation of the Internet, that is why they have attracted, I think, such a visceral and strong response. And so it occurs to me that perhaps one of the, one of the things this coalition could do is to try and articulate a vision for the fundamentals of the Internet and, and, and then recognize that people may take a different view about how societies, not necessarily nation states, but how societies approach information that is sent differently than they approach the importance of preserving the free flow of data inherently and the inherent architecture of the Internet so that it can work. I hope that that's not true. I hope that people understand that you can't have one without the other. But maybe we can start, we could get a broader consensus if we start saying, how do we ensure the, the, the widest possible access to the internet with the highest performance at the lowest cost for the maximum number of people on a permissionless basis such as we have enjoyed so far so that we get as much of the world online at the lowest cost possible as a, as a starting place which is obviously clearly happening as internet access growth is exploding in the areas where it is least dense Maybe that's not the right solution, and you can all tell me I'm wrong, but... Oh. I don't think you're wrong, Nick. Um, it's Vint. Let me start by asking you to think a little bit about how the Internet is actually constructed. Uh, it is a, a layered architecture. I don't want to make that overly rigid or prescriptive, but it's helpful to think of it as a layered architecture. And what happens is that as you work your way up in the layers, you abstract from the behavior of the lower layers. You actually hide some of the details. And as a consequence of this abstraction going upwards, there are emerging properties that come out of those abstractions. 
And what's interesting about the emergent properties is that as you get up to the point where you're in the application space, you're in a universe which is very nearly unbounded because it is an artifact of software. It's uh, literally an artifact of what the software, how the software interprets the bits that it's moving around. The consequence of this um, notion of emergent property is that the jurisdictional aspects of who is responsible for what or how do you go about enforcing some particular practice may vary from one layer to another, which is why, for example, we might tolerate an ITR uh, environment which is focused on the layers of physical interconnection. But we might not tolerate an ITR environment that looks up into the application space and says something about content and what we can and can't say or do. So uh, I think that uh, we're going to have to keep in mind that order arising out of this uh, abstraction and uh, emergent properties is going to vary from one layer to another. Second point, I think, is that the Internet has evolved successfully over the last 30 years of its operation, primarily because it's been largely a regulation-free environment. Most of the decisions that get made are freely made among parties. The protocols that are, that are invented and adopted are a consequence of consensus in the IETF. The decision to interconnect or not or even to build a piece of internet or to choose a particular piece of equipment or a particular version of software is entirely open and each individual operator chooses, even you do, when you buy a router to put at home and build a Wi-Fi station, you, you make a choice, nobody dictates to you anything except perhaps you should buy one that does the following things because if you don't it won't work. Uh, it should do IPv6 now because you need IPv6, things like that. So um, I think that the one core principle that we don't want to lose is that the relatively deregulated environment has allowed a lot of other forces and incentives to choose um, a way forward for Internet to evolve, prescribing its evolution with a set of constraining treaty-like agreements does not sound like we would reproduce in the next 20 years what we have enjoyed in the last 20. So I'm going to ask Siva to say some comments and at the same time see if we can get a mic up here in the front because Fatima wants to come in after. And while we're doing that, I'll say that the small committee that was pulling the panel here together obviously failed horribly in terms of gender balance. So I'm extremely happy that the three questions we've had from the floor have come from the women in the audience. So thank you. But if you could get a mic over here to Fatima while we go to Siva, be able to move forward a little more quickly. Um, actually, there was supposed to be greater gender balance. Desiree was supposed to be here, and I made some miscommunication, error in communication, so she is not here. I want to reflect on uh, the suggestion by Nick Ashton Hart, and he was talking about uh, the coalition articulating a vision for the future of the Internet. And what we could do is uh, bring together some of the most brilliant minds. Uh, Wint was talking about Bertrand, uh, the 18th century philosopher, reincarnated in 20th century. And I could think of um, people like um, diverse, people with diverse opinion, people like um, John Perry Barlow uh, went and uh, uh, some of the early founders of internet not only think of, not only to think of internet as uh, uh, the layer uh, as it means to technical people but uh, to think of internet as what it means to the common man it, it is it, it is much broader than the layer it is uh, much bigger than the layer it is everything for the common man and uh, we want to articulate a vision for uh, that internet uh, put together some of the brilliant minds and uh, come up with a vision and communicate uh, that vision to governments, to other stakeholders, so that we start working on it in the long term. And that is one of uh, what uh, I think we could do, and that's uh, open for uh, uh, corrections. And uh, the other thing that uh, we could do is uh, have uh, events between IGFs, and uh, uh, not I'm I'm not talking about only about events some activity between IGFs. It could be an event, it could be 
um, um, it, it could be anything. It could be anything um, uh, happening in different parts of the world. One in New York, one probably in Mexico, India, Pakistan, everywhere. And uh, so that way we can uh, continue our uh, activities and uh, we could also expand uh, participation in our mailing list and so that is these are some of my ideas and suggestions maybe and it's for Lynn to think over and uh, do it for the next uh, one or two years or more and so as as uh, somebody on my staff says I think that was a lateral pass to what he <laughs> believes is a more nimble player <laughs> I'm not sure the pass won't go back. That's called delegating <laughs> upward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only doing what, what Siva tells me to do. Um, did you have any other comments, Finn, before we go to Fatima? Yeah, I thought you were. Please, now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Fatima Cambronero. I am ISOC ambassador. I will speak I, on my personal capacity. Uh, uh, we are uh, speaking about the bottom-up processes and regarding to the future of the dynamic coalition, uh, little suggestion, I think it would be a good idea to do outreach in the nationals and regionals IGA to uh, get uh, the, the input of the community, the local and regional community to the global uh, and dynamic, the, that global com uh, dynamic coalition. Thank you. I'll just make a Twitter comment. Um, I couldn't agree more with Shiva when he mentions uh, the fact that there should be more IGFs. Um, they, you could call a rose by any name, but one would want a thousand flowers to bloom. One of the things that really concerns us is when you're looking at any, uh, because internet largely has become for us in this part of the world public good. When you're looking at any policy that affects that, um, has to be um, taken into consensus by multi-stakeholders and it has to has to um, look at opinions because it's going to affect our future. So that was one submission. And the second was um, we've had the Occupy Wall Street, we've had the Arab Spring. If we could look at this as an internet governance movement and not merely a forum and keep us all connected because there are um, vulnerable communities and I speak from the margins and mostly women and children are used as a peg by a lot of governments in a lot of spaces for backhand regulation. So that must not happen and if we could somehow facilitate this process of engagement and disseminate the learnings that becomes crucial because we celebrate this movement, we celebrate this opportunity, but I do believe uh, we owe it to the universe at the risk of sounding dramatic to make sure that we preserve what we have, which is ours. Thank you. I'd sign up to follow you in that vision <laughs> in a second, and we should certainly pull you into the steering committee if we can even did, identify did you just, one as Did such. you just delegate in <laughs> the other direction there? Just, just pulling in multiple voices. This, this is um, a dynamic coalition which is composed of multiple stakeholders um, drawn from different communities. Um, let me see, is there anybody who wants to come in on that or any other suggestions? I mean, we've certainly have taken a number of possibilities away in terms of some things we might go do more concretely. And we'll get you the mic back. And um, yeah, we'll take that away. There is a mailing list which is open, so please join the mailing list and let's see if we can identify some, some concrete activities. Yes, I know. Yes. We'll go to you and then we'll go to uh, Vint. Hello. So on concrete recommendations and following up on the comments, we were actually on a panel yesterday about national and regional IGFs. And I think for those of us who are attending the international IGF for the first time, but who have also attended the national ones, it is very unclear how are these related and how do these feed into each other. Um, and I, I want to go, you, uh, I, so, yes, so we, and also, so you, you have a very long name, I'm sorry, the, the gentleman from India um, mentioned, you know, what can we do in between? I mean, one of these things could at least be to create a wiki or something online where some of the outcome documents, the, um, 
can be put online and maybe have a, a discussion online. I think that having physical events obviously pr produces barriers um, to participation, even though we do have remote participation and that sort of thing. So I think there are multiple ways of doing that. And you know, the core values of the internet ultimately, I think, is one of the most important debates that's at hand. So this is a, a great opportunity. And um, you know, one thing I'd like to get from you guys before this ends is how to continue this discussion in between um, IGFs. Really appreciate your comments, and we'll go to Vint in a moment. And I'm also really, you know, really heartened to actually hear the support for core internet values because within ISOC, and I'm, we spend so much time talking about it that at some point you could start to feel that it's overdone, if you will, even when you see evidence that in fact it's still needed and more is needed. So I appreciate that. Vint? So I have uh, two suggestions, maybe three. Uh, in the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, where working groups uh, develop standards, one of the tactics that's used to solve particular problems is to send a design team out, maybe it's three or four people, not many more than that, to work through the problem and make concrete propositions. We might pick particular problems and have a design team approach to proposals to solve them, or at least proposals to approach them. Example, internet, uh, I'm sorry, intellectual property management, of course, it's a huge area, but a design team that tackles a conceptual framework for dealing with that in an online environment might be a concrete thing that could be done. I don't suggest it's the only thing. I'm just picking that as an example. Um, the other thing which I find extremely uh, appealing is this notion of Internet governance movement. I think it's, it, somehow, sometimes the words capture exactly what you want. And the, this is not a point solution thing. This is a continuous process. And in the case of core values, this internet governance movement, I would interpret to mean the preservation, a movement to preserve the values that have made the internet what it has been and what it should be in the future. Uh, so I like the term very much, and I appreciate your introducing that meme uh, into our intellectual universe. I'm sorry, there was, there was one other very practical thing to suggest. Google Plus has a service called Hangouts, and if you have adequate access to Internet bandwidth, Hangouts turn out to be a pretty convenient way to have a design team discussion, even if you're not physically in the same place. Um, there is a limitation of 10 users, and so... But that's why I said design team, which typically has three to four. I think he was trying to give you a product message. Um, <laughs> before we, I, I want to um, go around once more, um, giving preference to um, those that haven't spoken so much. So Sebastian has asked for some comments, and I think Paul, Alejandro, Nick, closing comments. Yeah, it's 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 a comment on on the comment you you made about the. Uh, the internet forum and uh, the fact that you start to be involved at the national level and the regional level before to come to the international one. It's uh, interesting because uh, IGF was created uh, the other way around. It was created uh, not bottom up but top down. And, um, and even at the beginning uh, it was very difficult to make uh, understood that uh, we need regional and national uh, IGF and it's still not understood everywhere. Uh, in France there is no IGF at all and I don't see when it will be. Uh, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting the, the way it was done and the way you, you live with. Uh, but I, I, I would like to take as a very good uh, suggestion that uh, how we can handle this subject uh, in each and every IGF and uh, not just uh, traveling because it's quite complicated but people who could be involved like you in your country or in your region and uh, with the tools we can have to be in remote participation on that subject. I think if we can uh, globalize this local intervention it will be a good, uh, good way to go. Thank you. Thank you Sebastian. Any anyone else? 
Final re remarks. Well, I think the, the uh, suggestion or the reference to the regional and national IGFs is, is really well put, and I think this kind of... Uh, um, the ongoing process that's implied by dy dynamic coalition is a is a really good one for uh, linkage at the at the regional and and national levels. And come to talk of that, there was um, recently an Australian uh, IGF which had a really nice session, a little too ambitious as it happened for the time available, but it was a really nice approach to internet values, which started with a sort of a, a brainstorming on what are the aspects of the internet that are fundamental that we believe are fundamental. And which we would, which we either take for granted, as I mentioned before, or which we would uh, we would uh, regret if if we lost. And um, and I think that's a really interesting interesting approach. But one of the one of the uh, sort of problems I guess I had with the process was that it was a little bit overly expansive for me. So it tended to capture everything that we wanted out of the internet. You know, whether freedom of speech was on the list, I'm not sure. But it was sort of it could have been uh, it could have been the way the with that brainstorming approach. And I think the powerful term there is a, a word I, I learnt to um, spell during uh, WISIS, which is subsidiarity. And it's this idea that the solution to any given problem is best located closest to that problem. It doesn't mean geographical, actually. Um, I'm just recalling that Rohan Samarajeva made the statement that international treaties should be limited to what they and they alone uh, need to do which is also a statement of subsidiarity. So if we're talking about internet principles, I'd like to suggest to bear that in mind and to be really looking at what's fundamental to the, to the internet, not, not to do with our expectations and our, our higher aspirations out of the internet, because we kind of know that's kind of un, unlimited, really, um, but, to, but to look at it from that, that point of view and that maybe that's something that, that an exercise um, in the meantime or through also with linkage to regional and national IGFs uh, we, could, uh, we could look at. Thanks. So very interesting comments as well. Alejandro or Nick, any quick closing comments before people need to run? Um, very briefly, um, I think that the, 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 the point of subsidiarity is very well uh, put by, by Paul, <coughs> and we must, must make a uh, form follow function. In many countries, uh, raising a national IGF uh, brings a number of metaphors. It's like kicking a sleeping dog while you're rising a, a, a high antenna under a thunderstorm and uh, painting yourself a target and uh, a, few more me a few more of those but it's really not necessarily the desirable thing you, you, you have to find the, the tactic that's local, uh, locally appropriate. I do take very seriously the, the, the excitement and the, and the enthusiasm uh, the wiki actually already exists, it, uh, we have to uh, I take responsibility I guess together with Shiva to activate it and made it known and made it available for you to contribute. And there, we have a mailing list that we will uh, include you in and make more active. Uh, all, all, all these things exist, and I'm committing to you to put a lot of effort into making it continue and be of service and be actually fed by everybody. Nick, and just one quick comment. You can actually get to the Dynamic Coalition from the IGF homepage on the left hand, and we'll make sure that you can get easy access to the list and that sort of information from there as well. Th that was going to be my question is do we want it like people to give an address or something who want to get on the mailing list or is it easier to just go to the IGF website or something? Let's see what uh, you could do uh, is uh, you can all uh, give me your uh, cards and uh, I'll straight away by today evening I'll send you a mail uh, uh, giving you the link to the mailing address or send you the invi invitation to the mailing list straight away. I, I'm having a small cognitive dissonance right now and the reason is that we were talking about trying to move away from nation state sovereignty and everything else so why do we think that we have to have national and regional IGFs? Why aren't we talking about people who are, uh, have common interests no matter where they happen to be? And the organizing principle is not where you are, but what you think and what you're interested in. It has to do with travel costs. No, that's why we use the Internet in order to do this in the first place. But Google Hangout only allows 10 people at once. Well, that's so that's what a design team is all about. And besides which... There's also on-the-air version, which allows a bazillion people to listen uh, in while the other ten are talking to each other. You'd have an answer. So, so I actually think we need both, obviously. I mean, there are some discussions that are really well-advanced, local level, local language, really particular. You can take it to the concrete, and then you can actually use that to move forward and, and drive action. 
and yet there's an awful lot of learning that it, that happens in broader forums and exchange of best practices and thoughts and your your ideas are enriched and so I think there's a, a lot of value in both of them and I think that's actually one of the good things about the global IEGF if that's what we're calling it and a whole host of different types of forum whether it's a national IEGF or it's some workshop or that you know it, it's about discussion communication exchange of ideas um, we're a little over time. I'd like to really thank the remote participants for hanging in there. I'm, I'm sure this isn't nearly as um, robust or enriching a, uh, activity as is when you're in the room. And I see one comment um, back here from... Just one comment uh, to the uh, recent comment of Mr. Surf. Um, from remote uh, uh, participant, Seth Johnson says, um, uh, the general purpose nature of uh, copyright comes from the inherent flexibility of information once it's published. This is reflected in the fact or idea, vice versa expression, dichotomy. You don't really deal with the nature of copyright online if you just talk about works as bags of bits. So uh, I think this is a question. Uh, why sovereignty is strictly limited to rights? People assure their rights via local sovereignties. It's a matter of recognizing that the people must rely on that for rights versus the broader oversight the nation states attempt so it was a comment, in general. So well, look, I mean, if you want me to respond, one thing I need to point out is that the bag of bits uh, is not static necessarily, because if it's a piece of software or if the bits need to be interpreted by a piece of software, it's a very dynamic thing. If, so if the criticism uh, or comment is that bag of bits is equivalent to a book or other static object, uh, I don't believe that they have to be. I think that they can be extremely dynamic kinds of, of elements. So I wasn't forcing you to respond, but I always like your responses. <laughs> um, so I'd also like to thank everybody here in the room, particularly for being so engaged, and I think some excellent questions and, and suggestions. Obviously, thank you to the panelists, um, and a very big thank you to Shiva as well. As I said, he really has been, um, as as Alejandro has said, the person who's actually kind of kept this alive um, from forum to forum. So I'd like to give everybody a round of applause and thank you very much. <laughs>